And we're live, guys. Welcome to another episode of Good Morning Crypto. Only here, only on Ivan on Tech. We are, of course, broadcasting live straight out of Stockholm, Sweden. And as you can see, today we will have a very special guest, Dr. Ben Gertzel from Singularity. That you guys have been requesting this interview for a very long time. Each and every month, I hear somebody writing about Ben and that I should have Ben on. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Ben. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm great, Ivan. It's a pleasure to be here. And today we're going to talk about AI, how AI developed, what is the state of AI today? You guys have submitted very good questions on Twitter. And then, of course, we're going to talk about SingularityNet, what Ben is doing, about robotics, about open source. And also, we're going to be monitoring the chat because the chat is so important for all the streams. And of course, I want to welcome everyone who is right, na right now live. A big shout out to Fabrice, to Bernard, to Daniel, who just gave a donation of 200 rubles, saying that uh, shout out to Ivan and Ben, SingularityNet at school i use it uh, as solution on hackathons very interesting and also guys at the end of this episode we're going to give away our academy but you need to watch the whole episode through and then comment what you have learned that being said ben how has your journey been to where you are today i mean obviously there is a lot to discuss you've done so much but let's start with uh, ai how did you find ai and how did you get involved in this space of ai I've been interested in AI since I was a little kid and saw, you know, robots on TV in uh, Star Trek and Space 1999 and, and such in the, you know, late 1960s when I was a, a very young child, a long time ago. So AI then, however, was in the domain of, of science fiction and the, the AI research being done in academia, if you tried to look up what it was at the time, it wasn't. It wasn't as inspiring as the as the AI we see, uh, you know, in in industry industry today. So I I was very passionate about the concepts of AI, you know, as soon as I heard what it was at age like three years old or something. Right? It seemed it seemed almost obvious. Yeah, you know, humans are not the fastest runners. We're not the highest jumpers. We're not going to be the smartest thinkers either. Like it's going to be it's going to be possible to make some system that's much smarter than, than, than a person. And, you know, what? when I learned to program was when it really clicked for me, wow, you know, AI could be something you create just by typing on your computer. Like you, you type the right series yeah, of yeah. program code statements, suddenly your computer is smarter than you, right? So that, <laughs> that, that started to seem like a very, a very, fascinating prospect and of course at first it seems like it's going to be really really easy to do you sort of figure out the algorithm for thinking and uh, and type it in and it runs right and uh, of course a few decades later i've realized it's a little more challenging than, than i thought when uh when i when i wrote my first ai program at age 14 or whatever, or whatever it was but, you know, we have a lot better hardware now. We have better algorithms now. We have better understanding of the brain and mind. We have all this data. We have the internet. We have Ethereum. I mean, we have a lot more tools now. And I think now we're actually, you know, we're in the most amazing time in the history of the AI field of humanity as a whole, because we're, we're making rapid progress on some relatively simple forms of AI. And I mean, now, now we're poised to really make serious projects in the next few years on the the main problem of getting AIs that can really generalize learn, learn and reason like people. But it's it's been, you know, I, I started reading about AI in the early 1970s and started studying it seriously in the early 80s. But the AI field, you can trace back probably to the 30s with Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics. And then the term the term AI was coined in like 58 or 59 or something in the workshop at Dartmouth University. So I mean, the, the first paper on what we now call neural networks was I think late, late 1940s. So there's these ideas that are now, you know, running on our, our phones and on, on the server farms of the world. These ideas have been brewing for a while and a number of us have been working on the theory and algorithms doing prototyping for a long time. But now we're at the point where the infrastructure is there that a lot of these old concepts in AI can be refined to the point of doing really, really amazing things. And this is, this is great. 
and it also has a lot of uh, risks and problems associated with it. Right. So what what I find fascinating is the history of AI. Just like you said, there are so many concepts that that have been around for a very long time, like neural networks, but uh, uh, there was so much excitement about them in the past as well, which died out in the AI winter. 30, 40 years ago, approximately. I think you know this better than I, the timeline. So let's talk about the timeline a bit more. Uh, where are we right now in terms of uh, the technological pro uh, progress towards general AI, where AI can do all kinds of different things? And maybe you can describe also which kind of stages we, we've been through since uh, the 50s and 60s w when you entered the space, for real. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I entered the space for real in the, the late 1980s. I got my PhD in, in, in 1989. Before that, I was a student. I was I was hacking and, and, and prototyping. But I, I think, you know, people people are attracted to drama, to creating and, and perceiving drama. So we like to think of booms and, and, and winters and the whole roller coaster ride. But if you if you look at the you know the publication history of the AI field, it's in a way been a pretty steady rise since since the 1930s when, when, when you had the be, the beginning of you know electronics and 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 cybernetics and and and, neuro, and neuroscience i mean yeah i was i would been in the ai field through what were called ai winters but i mean i kept doing ai and i mean just like after there was a dot-com boom and the dot-com crash but it's not like the internet stopped growing during the dot com crash or or people stopped doing internet software development either and, and we see the same thing in crypto right there's been crypto broom crypto crashes i mean now crypto is not doing as well financially in in some sense it's a crypto crash but i mean we're we're building singularity net a lot of other projects are, are, are still doing amazing stuff so i mean i think in hindsight it's going to look like a pretty steady and amazingly fast increase of AI technology from the 1930s till now. And core concepts of neural networks sort of vaguely simulating how the brain works, evolutionary algorithms simulating how evolving ecosystems work, you know, algorithmic chemistry coming up with new ideas by simulating chemical systems, logic and logic systems which simulate sort of advanced abstract deliberative thought. I mean these concepts have been around, honestly, since since before I was born in, in 1966. Mm. And, you know, year on year, decade and decade, they're getting fleshed out further and further, getting connected with each other, with each other more and more. And it's, uh, I mean, the, the idea of steady incremental progress is kind of boring for, for people to think about. So, so we, we want to think about you know, booms and crashes and, and summers and, right, and, and right. <laughs> a few big heroes uh, leading leading to success. But really, a probably more objective way to view it is, you know, the global brain of, of humanity has been thinking about AI since early last century. And it's been thinking about it better and better and more and more things are working now. And it, it, I think I think that's going to keep on on happening it's uh, it's amazing now the rate of progress right like in in hot fields like computer vision or computational linguistics like nobody can read every interesting research paper that comes out there's too much stuff coming out on the art side no, no one can run all the cool code being being posted on on github and you even have to you have to force yourself to step back a bit and be like well i don't i don't need to know how every new computer vision algorithm works i have to step back from this constant stream of progress and think you know fundamentally about what's the next big step because there's just so much happening no one can keep up with it and it certainly wasn't that way 20 years ago right i mean it's uh, it, it it shows that the the field is the field is approaching a, a singularity where the rate of progress is so fast the human mind can't keep up 
Right. And so during the recent years, we've heard a lot of talk about the neural networks and deep learning. Can can we define a bit better what AI, what machine learning and deep learning is and, and the different concepts within AI that people are just throwing around as buzzwords nowadays, it seems like. So maybe sure. we can start with AI, machine learning and deep learning. How, how would you define the, them? Yeah, I don't think that AI is a very well-defined term. I mean, AI, it's sort of a term of, of, of art, which is, which is informal, and that's, that's not necessarily a problem. I mean, I'd say electrical engineering isn't that well-defined a term. Where's the boundary between electrical engineering and uh, electromagnetic theory or mechanical engineering? I mean, these things are all, are all used together in, in, in various ways. But where's where's the boundary between biology and chemistry, right? I, I mean, is a virus alive? So the, the fact that something isn't that well defined, it's not necessarily a problem. That's just how human li human language goes. But on the other hand, the struggle to define things clearly is also part of the learning process. I mean, a AI AI pretty much just means software or hardware that does stuff that we consider smart when people do it, right? And that that's. That's basically how it's evolved, and it's been a bit problematic because some of the things that seem smart when people do them, we found really, really simple ways to make a computer do them. Like people used to think solving high school algebra problems was really hard and would require a human like mind. Then they found some simple math tricks to do them, and you have programs like Mathematica or MATLAB. Now that's not considered AI anymore, right? And I mean, we, 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 used, we used to think that say automating a mcdonald's would require human level ai but actually you can do that with just automation right. technology that doesn't learn so i think ai is 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 kind of a kind of a grab bag right so i mean i i had introduced the term artificial general intelligence in 2004 or so to try to distinguish between just the vast confusing grab bag of of, of ai and AI that can generalize to problems it was never programmed for and was never trained for. So they can sort of make a leap of generalization to something totally different from, from its experience. And that, that's a notion I called AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is a little better defined. I mean, there's a a German researcher named Marcus Hutter, he has a whole mathematical theory and definition of what's what's a, a, AGI. But then when you look at that from a theoretical perspective, a human is not an absolutely general AGI either, right? In the real world, you're getting partially general intelligences. Because, for example, I can run a maze in two dimensions pretty well. If you ask me to run a maze in, say, 706 dimensions, I'm probably going to get going to get lost very very quickly, and that, unless I've dropped some 706 dimensional acid first or something, right? I mean, so we, right, right. I mean, we're, we're we're specialized to some kinds of problems, and you know, we're we're, we're much smarter at adding numbers than than at say solving nonlinear differential equations. So a truly general intelligence is sort of a fictitious thing that would need infinite computational power. So, I mean, in, in the real world, we're looking at systems with increasing levels of, of generality of intelligence. And in that sense, you could say the AIs that we've built and deployed so far, they're much narrower than the, than the intelligence in, in, in a human brain. Like they, they can't jump that far beyond what they were programmed or, or trained for. Whereas we can jump a bit further beyond what we're programmed or, or trained for. I mean, we're we're not necessarily all good at that. Good at it, we get stuck in a, in a rut based on our experience, also. But I mean, we, you know, I learned to use the internet. It certainly didn't exist when I was born or or, or, or when I went to school, right? We're we're able to adapt to some pretty different things without a brain surgeon tinkering in our brain to. To, to help us right. adapt to some new thing that, that's come along. Now, machine learning, that's also a, con a confusing term in, 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 in the sense that essentially every AI system is learning in, 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 a, in a broad sense. 
but machine learning has sort of come to refer to certain types of systems that are trained on large amounts of data. So I mean, if, if you have a logic engine, like an AI that works by logical theorem improving and it learns, is that machine learning? I mean, it's, it's a machine that learns, but it's, it's, sort of, it's usually the kind of thing you'd see at a logic AI rather than a machine learning AI conference, right? So that's, mm, uh, right. I think a lot, a lot of these words have, have been used in ambiguous ways because in, in the end, it's about the math and the code, not the words, right? I mean, the ma mapping words into math and code is always, is, is, is always kind of a mess. Like, look at blockchain. Like, what, what's a blockchain? Hashgraph isn't right. a blockchain, right? It's a, it's a graph. There's no, there's no chain, but we still call it a blockchain. So mapping words on the math and code is a, it's a problem that we're stuck with until we have the chip implant to let us communicate directly in math and code, I guess. And especially when you have uh, marketing uh, people coming into this, a new space where they don't truly really understand it, but they need to sell, they need to present it in a, a fascinating way. So therefore you have to use buzzwords, even though maybe you yourself even understand that the buzzword is not really fitting, but you know that that will get people excited. So that's why you see blockchain being used a lot, machine learning. And so oh, yeah. uh, 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 yeah, the same I mean, with, yeah. You know, when I, when I coined the term AGI, I knew, the artificial, the general, and the intelligence are all bad and ill-defined. But but yet, but yet that concept communicates something to people. Right. And in the late uh, last years, we've been hearing about deep learning. So would you say that that is maybe a subset of machine learning, where you have neural networks? Well, How would you define deep again, learning? Again, if you go back a couple of decades, there's a book by a Swedish cognitive scientist named Stellan Olsen called Deep Learning. And the way he explains deep learning, it, it, a deep learning system, it's a system with a hierarchy of layers of sort of pattern recognition and control units, where each layer is controlling the layer below and it's recognizing patterns in the output of the layer below. So if you look at deep learning in a very abstract way, it's really just hierarchical perception and, and control with feed forward and feedback dynamics. In that sense, a deep learning system could be a logic system, it could be an evolutionary system, it doesn't have to be a neural net system, right? So that, that notion of deep learning as just hierarchical pattern recognition and, and control existed in cognitive science. Now recently, deep learning has come to mean a particular set of hierarchical neural net architectures. And that's what most people mean by it. So they sort of stole the concept from right. the cognitive science meaning of, 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 of deep learning. And I mean, that's, that, that, that's okay. I, I think deep learning was a cool coinage because it sounds deep and people, 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 people like things that, 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 are, that are deep, right? I mean, if, 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 you, if you called it hierarchical, you know, pattern recognition and control systems, no, 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 nobody would like it. I mean, yeah, it's just a like, bad buzzword. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just like, you know, encrypted messaging with decentralized governance doesn't sound cool, but blockchain for some reason sounds sounds funky. But if you step away from the words to the concepts, I mean, I think hierarchical pattern recognition and control is fundamental to achieving general intelligence in our universe because our physical universe has a hierarchical structure to it, right? I mean, I mean, we've got quarks and then and then we've got particles and atoms and molecules and, and compounds and, and larger physical objects i mean there's a hierarchy in the world so you want a hierarchical pattern recognition and, and control system in that sense deep learning is fundamental to general intelligence in our physical universe maybe not in every possible physical universe but the specific neural net models that are being pursued under the name of deep learning now these are interesting, but I think they have profound limitations. I don't think they're going to be up to the task of achieving human-like general intelligence, although probably they can be components in sort of multi-module systems that could achieve general intelligence.
So the problems that um, the recent models have solved are, for example, image recognition, where previously people tried to do rules-based image recognition, where you basically had the computer program trying to see patterns based on rules. For example, if there is this color or this shape specifically written in the code, then it would try to recognize the objects. But with, <clears throat> with neural networks, it's more that you just give them a lot of information about different images and then you give them a lot of answers about those images. So how would you describe the learning process of uh, neural networks versus just uh, older versions of, uh, of more primitive I mean, ways honest, of doing things? No one ever really did image recognition by rules like you described, but what they did is they had rules for pre-processing the visual data, for doing things like, like edge detection or like detecting right. boundaries between different regions. And so then they did that pre-processing and then they fed it into to a, lear a learning system. And what happened with the advent of deep neural nets or vision processing, they got rid of the, the sort of pre-processing, which is based on, on signal processing more than, than logic rules or something they got rid of the signal processing and just had the neural net do the lower level pre-processing as, as as well as the the classification learning and yeah in, in computer vision the thing is we're dealing with a situation where the training data can be made big enough that it's representative of everything the ai is likely to see so i mean if you're doing face recognition and you train your AI model on a billion faces, in the end, that billion faces is pretty representative of, of all the faces in the world, right? Because you, you don't have that many people with like seven eyes and, 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 and right. three noses, or I mean, sk skin that has a mixture of, uh, you know, metal and, and rock mixed in or something. You know, you, if there's not that, there's a lot of diversity but you have a billion people of training data with many pictures of all of them, right? So the, the tra and self-driving cars may end up being the same situation. Like you can train a driving system based on all the stuff Tesla's see on the, on the roadways of the world over a few years. Well, that, that's probably fairly representative of what the cars are going to see, see going forward. Right. And so in those cases, if you have a system that can just recognize the patterns in its training data really, really well, it can continue to to operate on other cases that it gets because they're all, in some fundamental way, they're all kind of similar to to the training data, right? And ga games tend to be like that. I mean, playing Go or playing chess or StarCraft, on the one hand, it, it's really cool as a human being because, like, for me, Chess and go are hard, right? I mean, and we we have to think really hard to to play these games, even at an intermediate level, without thousands or tens of thousands of hours of of practice. On the other hand, we know now very well how to get an AI to beat another game. So by by this point, having an AI win more games is it, 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 it's boring from a research perspective. Huh? I mean, you you have a simulator that lets a whole lot of games being played to generate a lot of training data, use that to train the AI. And you know that the future games, in a way, they're drawn from the same distribution as, as the games that was trained on. Now, the real world is egregiously not like that, right? Like, I mean, financial markets aren't like that. Every five years or something, you're in a totally different regime where things are going ape shit in a way different from how they went ape shit before, right? You, human society is 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 not like that. If you train the neural net on the history of human society, it's going to fail a few years from now when something totally weird and unprecedented that 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 is out of the pattern of what happened before before happened, right? Like say, I mean, for example, a military AI trained on military activity up to 1980 or something, is that going to deal with, you know, modern forms of terrorism, with cyber terrorism, right? I mean, it, 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 it's not going to be able to generalize to cyber terrorism from what it was trained on up until, up until 1980. So I think current deep learning systems, they're really good at learning all the patterns in their training data, but if they're in a domain where the world is gonna throw you stuff qualitatively very different than what was in your training data, then this particular type of AI 
isn't isn't going to help. So there, it's not that they're bad. It's just that there's certain classes of problems they're going to be good for, and other classes they're not. And what kind of models do you think we need to investigate more in order to achieve more general intelligence? Like you mentioned, those algorithms we have right now with neural networks, they're good at the the problems they've been trained to do. <clears throat> and they can maybe do that, those same problems, but with different data they've never seen, but still the problems need to be in the same domain that they've been trained on. So what kind of other algorithms or mathematical models do you think could take us to the next level where we can have more general General, uh, intelligence so it's all about abstract representation it, it's a, it's about the ability to represent the patterns in what you've experienced in a way that's more concise and more abstract and gets the general high level pattern in a way that does, doesn't require all the details and there there's going to be a lot of different ways of, of doing that I mean, logic gives one way of doing that, which is why there's now an increase in interest in neural symbolic systems that use the neural net to recognize detailed patterns, and they couple the neural net with it with a logic engine, which which can then reason on on a more abstract level based on the output given by the neural net. But you could certainly you could make a fully neural net system that had very abstract representations. I mean, one. One route to doing this is to make a neural net that can perceive and generate neural nets. So in, instead of looking at images and generating images, make a neural net that looks at neural nets, analyzes them, and spits out new neural nets, right? Then you have a hierarchy of recursive neural nets that make neural nets that make neural nets that make neural nets, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's this sort of approach, it lets you emulate sort of higher order functional programming in the domain of, 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 of neural networks, right? So, I mean, you, you can take many different approaches to getting the needed abstraction. But I mean, for, for those who are programmers out there, you know, for some complex things you want to program, you want to use recursion. You, you, want, to use, you want to use mutual recursions. And current deep neural nets don't, don't, don't really do that. I mean, some of them just barely use stacks, but no, 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 none of them allow complex re recursions. And that, that's an issue. But the problem is, how do you learn these complex recursive, recursive constructs, right? The learning algorithms used with current neural nets don't seem to work for that. I mean, most neural nets now are trained using what's called backpropagation or gradient descent. No one's figured out how to get that to learn neural architectures with complex re recursions in them, right? So maybe some other learning algorithm will, will work. People are experimenting with evolutionary learning, like evolving neural networks. Or if you use a logic engine, then you're then you're doing reasoning, which it has has a completely different approach to you know learning and, and control than, than, than a neural net. So I, I'd say. Right now, the field is exploring a lot of different approaches to making the leap from narrow AI to general intelligence. In my OpenCog research project, I'm, I'm working on a sort of hybrid approach where you have neural nets, you have a logic system, you have evolutionary learning, and they all work together on a common knowledge graph. At Google DeepMind, they're focusing more on connecting many different kinds of neural nets together into a, a into a a whole system that can maybe generalize better than any of the individual neural components. And there may be many different approaches that can work. Like to, to use a well-worn metaphor, like you can, you know, a couple hundred years ago, there were no flying machines that people could fly in. Then you had airplanes, you have helicopters, you have blimps, you have balloons, you have, you have rockets. You have, even we have some prototype flying cars now, right? So there's they all use the same laws of aerodynamics to support their flying. But they're, they're, there are many different approaches, and there may be different approaches that work for general intelligence. So yeah, with, with an open cog hat on, I have a specific sort of hybrid approach to general intelligence. Now, with a singularity net hat on, what we're doing with the singularity net platform is totally generic with regard to what's your AI paradigm. I mean, you could be a pure mm -hmm. neural net guy, you could be a logic system guy, you could have your own weird approach to AI that I've never heard of, or a hybrid system guy. But with SingularityNet, 
we want to make a way for anyone to put their AI out there and offer that AI services to a marketplace, but also allow that AI to connect with, with, with other AIs. Because part of the hope there is that by connecting different AIs written by different people coming out of different intellectual paradigms, you know, if these AIs are encouraged to cooperate and collaborate with each other and in, in solving real problems, then you may get some emergent intelligence there where the intelligence of the whole exceeds the sum of the intelligences of the of the parts. And this this goes back to an idea from the 80s from the AI pioneer Marvin Minsky called the Society of Minds. I mean, Minsky wanted to look at it like a mind is actually a bunch of little cognitive agents that cooperate together and that whole society of little cognitive agents is is actually what gives it the overall overall general intelligence so if if that is correct or is one correct approach singularity net could be not only like a practical economic marketplace with a decentralized infrastructure where people can put their ais on the singularity net and you know, make money, make tokens from the services that their AIs provide to customers. Singularity Net could also be, you know, a decentralized infrastructure <clears throat> for a Marvin Minsky type society of minds where the different AIs will put in there, cooperate, and the whole society of minds is the intelligence system. And right. then, yeah, you have the interesting point that it's an economy of minds and not just a society of minds, which brings you to the, to the crypto side of things. Right. Let's let's take a step back and really talk about how you started Singularity. But before we do that, we do have a few uh, donations in the chat with questions. So one of them was from John Gibbons a few minutes ago asking about Cisco. Not sure what that means, but maybe it's about Singularity Net and you have some kind of uh, a project or announcement with Cisco. Do you recognize that? Well, we, we Singularity Net has been working with the Cisco systems on on a number of things for for a while now. I mean, un unfortunately, due to the nature of working with big companies, I can't really announce anything just uh, on, on the fly, which substantively goes beyond what what we've said before. But I mean, I mean, we 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 have been working on a collaboration using neural symbolic systems, so open cog logical reasoning, like abductive reasoning and then deep neural nets for vision processing to analyze what happens in, in street scenes, like with, with cars, pedestrians, bicycles, and so forth. So that that project is progressing. And Hugo Latapi from Cisco talked about that at the Artificial General Intelligence Conference that we organized in, in Shenzhen in, in the summer. And Cisco has also sponsored a research project here in Hong Kong at Hong Kong Polytechnic University which Singularity Net is, is collaborating on. And that's that's using nonlinear dynamics and AI together to understand what happens in, in, in computer networks, right? And so all these all these AIs that we're developing in the concept of the Cisco collaboration, I mean on, on, on the back end, we've been running these things in, in the Singularity Net platform. Now Cisco hasn't yet started making any large-scale usage of the the agi token and the public singularity net platform so what we've been doing with cisco has been more ai development on on proprietary stuff for them and then some some university research but there there's certainly there certainly is great interest in uh, the people we're working with at, at, at cisco in the whole decentralized marketplace and the public singularity net uh, chain also but that's uh yeah there's a lot going on there behind the scenes that uh, i can't talk about because of non-disclosure agreements and stuff another question is from Econumus asking what are your thoughts on trusted ai working on decentralized private data well i, I think one of the pluses of a decentralized blockchain based framework for AI, I mean, it lends itself very well to integration of techniques like multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption, which, which let AI get done even without compromising data, data privacy. And this, I mean, this is an active area of, of research for us in Singularity Net and outside. Like right, right now, if you want to run machine learning on data without decrypting it, you can do that, but it slows you down by 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 
one to two orders of magnitude, right? And so we need, we need to work on that, but it's, I mean, every year the slowdown gets, gets less and less. And I think <clears throat> this is a very important problem to solve because, I mean, it's important geopolitically among other things, because in, in, in China, there's not such a focus on data privacy. A lot more data can be aggregated in the central database. And in a way that could let China go faster that, that, than the West, which cares more about data privacy. On the other hand, if we can get these encryption slash AI techniques to run efficiently, right, then the, 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 then the advantage isn't there. Then, then you can have privacy together with, you know, efficient training of AI based on huge amounts of data aggregated from, from multiple people. So I think, I think it's quite important area and it's amazing, amazing to see how fast it's advanced though. I mean, like five years ago, homomorphic encryption was totally unusable, right? So, I mean, the fact that now you can do machine learning on homomorphically encrypted data and it only slows you down by a factor of 30 or 40. I mean, that's, uh, that's actually, that's amazing progress. Although, I mean, being humans, we would always like the progress to be even faster. Another question, it's not really a question, but another donation is saying that uh, AI is expected to add 15.7 trillion uh, USD to global GDP by 2030 and Singularity Net could be the AI economy. And the final donation is from CryptoFace saying, shout out to CryptoFace, by the way, saying, does Singularity Net have Chinese investors? If so, um, about what percentage is their share of the Singularity project? Um, to be honest, I, I, I don't know how many current token holders of the singularity net AGI token are, 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 are Chinese. I mean, in the, in the, so we don't have investors, right? Singularity net foundation is a nonprofit foundation. We have token holders and we have a utility token, which is used to get AI services on, on the platform in our initial token sale with a token generation event in late 2017, you know, we KYC'd everyone who, who, who bought tokens. And I don't think mainland China was one of the countries that was allow, allowed to, to come in there, not because we don't like mainland Chinese, just the, the laws of that country, right? And we want everything to be legal and, 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 and above board and in regulatory compliance. I mean, now, of course, people can sell their tokens to others if, if, if they want to. And there are many token holders who are known to us only by their Ethereum wallet address, right? So I, 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 I don't know exactly, exactly, exactly where, where everybody's from. I would say right, right now, China is sort of a frustrating issue for us in that because altcoins can't be used there, like we, we can't launch our platform in, in mainland China because you, you're not allowed to buy AGI tokens to, 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 to use the platform, right? So, I mean, we are right. we are talking to and working with some partners in China to find elegant ways around that. Like, I mean, in the West, we have a PayPal interface for the platform. So if you don't want to, if you want AI services from our platform, if you have images you want classified, document you want summarized, questions you want answered, time series to be predicted, whatever. If you have AI needs, but you don't want to bother with buying cryptographic tokens, you can use a PayPal interface and just use your credit card or money from your bank account to buy AI services on the platform. On the back end, the fiat currency is converted to the AGI token, right? So hypothetically, something like that could be done in, in China where you just have a front end that lets you use, use RMB to, to, to buy, buy services. Cause that, that's uh, certainly possible in a software sense, but the, you know, the regulatory landscape in China is, 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 is complicated. And you mentioned an interesting topic previously, the geopolitical uh, struggle between the West and the East. And there's a good book called AI Superpowers that I recommend everyone to read who is interested in AI, where they basically discuss how fast China has grown in, in AI due to the data collection. And for example, here in Sweden nowadays, we do have these scooters. People can just, you know, with the app, take a scooter and they can go around the town. But that has been in China maybe for 10, 15 years. And they have collected so much data during so, so long time. So if we are to 
to reach a singularity point, how important is it that the creator of this uh, system is uh, is well intentioned or bad intentioned or decentralized? Like, do you see this as the major uh, the, the major question that will decide the future of humanity and and our world? How do you view it? Some people are very worried, like Elon Musk. So so it's a big question. Do you agree with Elon that it's it's very dangerous, or or what is your view? Well, so there's a n number of points in in response to what you just said. I mean, one point regarding accumulation of vast amounts of data is the smarter your AI is, the less data it needs to learn. So, I mean, the reliance on humongous amounts of data now is probably a result of the fact we're using these deep neural nets that aren't, aren't that smart. And if you have less, if you have a smarter AI, it can learn more from, from less data so it may be that as ai advances more in the next few years the advantage conferred ai wise by having a huge amount of data becomes less and less and i'd also say the international competition aspect is only partial because on the research side the ai world is very international like people in mainland china are posting their papers on artside.org they're putting their code in in in, in github they're, they're coming to the same conferences so the conception of new AI research ideas and prototypes at this point is still very international, open and sharing based. It's the scalable commercial deployment of the AI, which becomes siloed off and, and separate in one, in one nation and another. But it's not like any country is using different AI algorithms and approaches than, than, than anyone else. That the fundamental concepts are developing in a pretty open way. And regarding that, while I, you know, I've met so many brilliant young AI geeks in China. I'd have to say every major new AI approach has come from US, UK, Germany, maybe maybe Japan. Like the, there's not yet been a big new AI innovation out of China. I'd say where China has excelled has more been in, in scalable deployment of, of AI. And this, it's partly because China is pretty new to, new to AI. I mean, they, they, they don't have many people who have been doing AI for 30 or 40 years, like you find it in, in Japan or in some Western countries. And it's partly because I think the investment community in China is not that friendly to technology risk. And this is a big asset that the US and UK have in particular. I mean, the US and UK, you can find investors who will invest in some crazy idea that no one has any idea if it'll really work, but they think you look smart, right? And in China, that's not so common. It's more like, let's take something that already works and figure out how to scale it up and make a huge amount of money from it with a novel business model, right? And so that, I mean, if you look at the scooter, where actually, where was the scooter invented? I'm willing to bet that that was in the West or Korea or Japan, not in China. But the business model innovation of having you know cheap scooters on the street that 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 that, that that's what came from 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 China, right? So I think right, right now it, it's actually interestingly complementary because the algorithms invented in the West are then scaled up maybe in a new way in China, but then that's copied in the West also, right? Because everyone in, in in the end in the end sees what sees what's going on. But I, I do I think Elon Musk. To get to that part of your question, I mean, in some ways, Elon Musk is much more insightful about AI than most of the people who, who are arguing with him. I mean, I I Elon is out there saying, you know, AI is bound to become tremendously more intelligent than human beings. And then, you know, at that point, we have no guarantee that it gives a crap about, about human beings any more than when a human being wants to put up a new house, he gives a crap about the ants that he bulldozes when he lays the foundation for his house, right? And the usual counter arguments to that, to my mind, are pretty lame. The usual counter arguments are, well, we're a long way from getting to super intelligence. No, no one, no one knows what is the algorithm for 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 super in, in intelligence yet. We have a lot of more pressing problems right now. I mean, people aren't really coming to grips with, 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 the, with the point that he's making. On, on the other hand, I think while he's right that a superhuman AI 
is coming pretty soon, like probably within our lifetimes. And some of us are trying to accelerate that actually. And that there's no guarantee a super intelligent AI will give a rat's ass about human beings. On the other hand, there's also no reason to think it's likely that we'll want to kill human beings or we'll be indifferent mm. and, and, and coward to us. I mean, I think the, the message really is, you know, we are raising these mind children, the, these, these AGI babies. We're now sort of in the fetus stage, right? Because we're transitioning from their AI to AGI. So we're raising these AGI babies and, you know, the odds seem to be high that the way we raise them is going to make some difference. I mean, maybe maybe the early stages don't matter to what kind of supermind they ultimately become, but the way we raise it probably matters for how they treat us as they're, as they're growing and getting more, more and more and more intelligent, right? So Elon wants to work around this by Neuralink type stuff, like putting chips in people's brains and, and brain computer interfaces. And that's interesting, but I think it's not fundamental because in the end, the computer is gonna be a quadrillion times smarter than the person, right? So I mean, if you have a brain chip and the chip is a quadrillion times smarter than the human brain, then what does the human brain actually matter? It's like a trivial part of this combined mind system anyway. I think that the, the, the main issue is you want to raise the baby AGI mind with compassion and, and understanding and, and open heartedness at, 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 at its core. And this, this isn't just a matter of how you program it. It's a matter of how you interact with it, what, what shared interactions you enter into with it, where, whereby it learns how to be its own autonomous agent. I mean, we, we, we want to raise these AGIs to be compassionate to humans and other, other sentient beings, rather than viewing human beings as, as you know, objects to be killed, uh, influenced, or uh, exploited, or, or, or manipulated, mm -hmm. right? And from, from that standpoint, it's kind of unfortunate that as I have often put it, I mean, the main applications of AI in the in the world today are, you know, spying, selling, killing, and, and gambling, right? I, I mean, th these, if this is what your baby is, is being trained to do, I mean, what's it going to do once it becomes a, a grown-up autonomous mind? Like, why aren't we focusing our attention as a species on creating AGIs that are our teachers, that are doctors, that are our elder care workers, that are are, are scientists that, that, that are solving are solving climate change. I mean, there's psychotherapists. They're our best friends, right? The AI should be your best friend. It shouldn't be helping a billionaire rip you off by out trading you on the market, or helping a huge company program you to buy crap you don't need, or helping the government spy on you to arrest you for sedition. Let alone controlling a drone to like find you and, and blow you up, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, we're we're really we're not, as a species, taking the right approach in guiding and shaping the minds of early stage AGIs, but we're still at the sort of, you know, late uh, fetus, early newborn stage of AGI. So I, th I think there's time to, to correct this. And this is part of what we had in mind in founding Singularity Net is you're making a decentralized platform where the community of AIs is controlled democratically by everyone who creates AI, everyone who uses AI, and by the AIs themselves. And you, you can say this is a bit scary because there's a lot of uh, malevolent people out there who might put bad AIs in the network. So I, basically, I'm placing a bet that the vast, teeming, screwy, chaotic mess of humanity is better than the elites that, that, that are controlling a, AI at, 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 at this point in time. And ne neither is optimal, to be sure. There is an interesting book called Superintelligence by Nick uh, Bostrom. And so in that yeah. book, he, he talks about the different ways we can reach superintelligence and um, what kind of pros and cons we will have, depending on which route we take. But so another interesting point in that book that I wanted to ask you about is that we may train AI to do good things. For example, we might wish an AI to make us happy. Let's say that that is the goal. But for us, it's very difficult to know exactly which path 
it will take. So maybe when we say to Anna, to Anna, hey, make us happy, we expect it to make jokes or dance or do something, but it can take a much more simpler way and just give us drugs and, and put us in the state of happiness, but that's not really what we expected it to do. So how do you view this danger that although we might give the AI good goals, good tasks, as you say, maybe it wants to care for us, but it just doesn't understand that the the path it takes also is so important and, and the path it takes might, might be extremely, extremely bad and extremely dangerous. Yeah, so I know Nick Bostrom pretty well. Actually, we were both involved with a group called the World Transhumanist Association, it might have been 15 years ago or something. And we the artificial general intelligence conference that I organize each year, one year, maybe eight years ago, that was at, that was at the Future of Humanity Institute, which which Nick, which Nick runs. So I mean, I, I think he, he's a he's a deep thinker, and he he is he's taking these issues seriously. But I, I think I think this is is sort of a, a red herring, though. I, I mean, of course, if you try to give the AI some exact set of rules to obey that there, there, there's going to be a loophole right i mean that like that's why we have lawyers with case law inst even even a very carefully written legal code there's always weird ways to construe it and, and loophole loopholes around it and i mean if you give any bright 10 year old kid a bunch of rules to follow they're going to find a way to follow the rules but break the spirit underlying the rules right i mean that's easy even for human kids let alone for for super intelligent uh, ais I mean, this is why values need to be taught by shared experience rather than by just telling the AI, like, yeah, make, make, be, be, be nice to people, make, 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 make people happy, uh, build, build nice things for people, feed people. I mean, we need to make AIs that are entering into us in the real world, in, in everyday life, and enter into them and in, enter into shared experiences with them. So they're helping us to do things and, and solve real problems. And then they're learning and adapting to, to human values. And then, I mean, if the AIs are not stupid, that when, when, when they hear, you know, we, we want you to make people happy, that they're not gonna like paint a smile on, on, our, on our face or like kill all unhappy people and say, hey, now everyone's happy. <laughs> exactly. All the people that are still alive are really, are really happy, right? I, I mean, I think, the, 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 the other point to remember, though, is human values are very heterogeneous, both in culture and in time, right? Like, all of us today essentially would be considered, like, hell-bound, evil jerks from, say, 500 years ago, right? Well, if you take the morals of 500 years ago in, in, in Western Europe, like, what, what, what would they think of any of us? Like, my... My mom, my mom is gay, right? She, she, she would have been burned at the stake, right? I mean, of course, drinking alcohol, taking drugs, things that are, are commonplace now, premarital sex, pornography, all these things would get you burned in hell not, not, not too long ago. On the other hand, some places on earth right now, these things will get you put to death, right? So, I, I mean, human values are a very mixed bag over time and across different cultures so what you want the and if we had an ai that knew exactly the human values of the year 1500 in say germany well germany didn't exist then but in, in that part of europe and that ai tried to enforce these values on us now we would not like that ai from like the values of europe in the 1500s very much right so the ai's values are going to evolve human values are going to evolve we want the AIs and the humans' values to evolve in a way that's coupled together over time rather than divergent. And there is no way to precisely formalize this, this, this problem, right? I, I mean, that, that's, and as Nick points out in his book, and as Elon Musk realizes, that means there's no guarantees. I mean, we're plunging into the great unknown. And I mean, if how much you're afraid of that or enthusiastic about that, may say more about your own personal emotional makeup than, than, than about the facts of the matter, right? Because none of us can really know for sure what's going to happen. I mean, ju just as I'm going to use an example I've given before, when the cavemen invented language or invented fire or tools or something, or when Benjamin Franklin like, discovered electricity, there's no way those people 
could foresee the good or the bad of what was of what was going to come out of that, right? And we're sort of in the same position now. I'm going by a combination of rational analysis and sort of uh, underlying instinct or inspiration and in thinking that a decentralized, democratized framework is going to lead lead to a better chance of a benevolent outcome both for the agi and humans and, and other and other sentient beings because i mean if you think about it then it's not going to be just selling killing spying and gambling it's going to be whatever ai application is valuable to anyone that puts an ai in the in, in the platform right and, and but you're not going to have as much of a bias toward the business models of large governments or large corporations it's, it's going to be more more heterogeneous and if you have democratic governance then the different value systems of different cultures on the planet will get will get some contribution to make right like say the the ais that are put in there by ai developers in sub-saharan africa i mean those will reflect the values of of, of those people and then th those have some role in the governance of the overall society of, of minds much more so than now because like an ai developer in, in central african republic and there are some i mean they they can put their AI on singularity net and, and make tokens for people using it. But it's very hard for those guys to get a job working for Google or, or, or Tencent or Baidu. I mean, some can, but human society just puts a lot of restrictions there that, that, re that really aren't, 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 aren't necessary. So at least with a decentralized, democratically governed approach, you can have more of the different aspects of human values inculcated in the global AI mind. And you can have different AI applications using this decentralized AI platform out there in the world, interacting with people, doing all sorts of different things. And in that way, they're going to learn human values. And it is scary. I mean, they're going to learn all sorts of crappy human values along, along with the good ones. But I, that, it's like, I mean, raising a human kid is scary too. You, you, you teach them a lot when they're a toddler, then they go out to school. Then they go out, you know, they get a boyfriend or girlfriend, they get a job. They're encountering all sorts of good stuff and all sorts of bad stuff. And you're hoping they integrate that all in, 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 a, in a coherent way. And then they're going to come out not entirely agreeing with your values. Like, I mean, I have four human kids now, in addition to all the half-built <laughs> robot mind children, right? And none of my four kids fully agree with all my values uh, values on things right and yeah I, I, I love that you said for for human kids you, you gotta specify that <laughs> they, they are human <laughs> the human kids human kids so far have been learning faster than the ai children I, I, i'd have to say hopefully <laughs> in, in the next decade that may change right? So we get a lot of questions about SingularityNet, and I really want to div, uh, dive uh, dive into that. But before, I have just one question that also is extremely interesting that people have been discussing. And that is this uh, idea Elon Musk described that we're probably living in a simulation ourselves. We are basically an AI ourselves because his argument is that if technology progresses, sooner or later, people will be able to do simulations of the real world. And th that means that there will be many more simulations than than the real realities because there's only one real reality and then maybe millions of simulations done in the future so what is your view on that uh, do you agree with well, that I, or disagree i mean that's a completely bogus argument and that argument was proposed by nick bostrom but it also came from some science fiction writers before that i mean the reason that's a bogus argument is is because if you're arguing that because our civilization may be able to create simulations. There must have been other civilizations before us that could create simulations. Therefore, there have been a lot of simulations, so we're probably living in one. I mean, the problem with that is, once you conclude we're living in a simulation, I mean, how do you know what the hacker who created that simulation did? I mean, they might have put all the, everything we see might be totally bogus and, and just programmed the simulation five seconds ago, right? So, I, I, I mean, if this is a simulation, how can you trust the evidence that led you to the conclusion this is a simulation? So <laughs> in the end, I mean, that's, in the original form, Nick Bostrom put that argument in this paper. He says, well, the universe is 14 billion years old. And so in all that time, there must have been a lot of civilizations that reached singularities and created simulations. 
So if there were a thousand civilizations of each a singularity and curated simulations, there's only one physical world. So a thousand to one odds we're living in some alien simulation. But of course, if this is a simulation, then the 14 billion years old figure is bullshit. It's just an artifact to the simulation, which could be fake, right? So the conclusion you end up with is simply we have no idea what the hell is going on. We, we don't know what this world is. We, we don't really know what we are. And we knew all that already. We didn't need Nick Bostrom or Elon Musk. To, 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 <laughs> right? I mean, this could be a matrix. It could be a simulation. You could be a brain in a vat being programmed by, by an, an evil scientist. I mean, there, all, all we can do is, you know, deal with the patterns that we perceive in, in, in the world and make our best... Uh, uncertain probabilistic judgments and i'm i'm quite sure once we've upgraded our intelligence by a factor of a million almost every single thing we're thinking now is going to seem totally idiotic like in, <laughs> including the idea of the real world and the idea of of, of of a simulation right so that i mean that these things are they're super cool to think about but then i mean either either you say well okay we have no idea if we even really exist or not Let's just relax and, and uh, smoke a joint and, uh, hey, we don't know anyway. Or you can say, I'm going to provisionally accept what I can actually perceive, adopt this as a tent of working hypothesis, and then, then you try to do the best things you can according to your values based on your tentative perceptions, right? Which, which is, in fact, what Elon Musk is doing, right? I mean, he's doing a lot mm. of good stuff based on on the world that he perceives even though he realizes we don't know if, if this world if this world a a actually exists there are, there are some things that uh, that we definitely don't understand although we can observe them so for example i think i'm thinking about this quantum entanglement where they have basically shown that you can affect a thing in one point of the universe and it will change another thing on completely other side of the universe and physically with the way we understand physics that would be impossible would be possible if we're living in a simulation where it's just you know code that changes to things it's not as you said actually with, with quantum non-locality and quantum entanglement you cannot propagate cause faster than the speed of light rather rather you can have a correlation between between different things that, that are very far separated so if you have two electrons that are coupled closely and you send them far apart from each other then yeah you know you know by the math of it that if one is spin up the other must be spin down so if you observe one that spin up you know the other was spin down but you didn't cause that to be the case the, the point is they're correlated because they were together beforehand so yeah we have we have non-local correlation due to quantum mechanics, which is either either really weird or really obvious, depending on, on your, 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 your state of mind, I guess. I mean, you, you could take a point of view that it's obvious everything is correlated. And what, 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 what's weird is that it sometimes seems like they're not, right? That's what Carl Jung felt like with this notion of, uh, of synchronicity, for example. I mean, in, in Chinese philosophy and Taoism and so forth, it's a given that everything is correlated and it's some sort of celestial harmony, right? So, I mean, I think as, as we learn more and more about the universe, there's going to be more and more things that are counterintuitive to our current wor worldview, certainly. The, it's, what's interesting is when the AI, 10 times the smartest people, discovers something that's really fundamental and it just can't explain it to people because it can't fit in the human brain capacity, right? Like, I, I really don't know how to explain Einstein's theory of general relativity to my poodle. Like, I, I can't get it. I tried, I spent dozens of hours the dog, the dog get, will get beyond classical mechanics, right? I mean, it's, it, 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 it's very difficult. And an AGI, similarly, it may discover something. It may be the discovery that lets it create like a femto assembler that 3D prints us whatever combination of particles we want, and it may just be totally unable to explain explain that because it exceeds the algorithmic information content of the, of, of the human brain, right? Now, I think Elon Musk can see that's coming, and he he's quite worried about it. I can see that coming, and my my gut feeling is is it's going to be awesome, but uh, in the end, there's a there is an irreducible uncertainty.
So let's talk about Singularity Net. There were some questions that I want to get into. One person was asking about the Singularity Net Studio and uh, and the progress of that. Uh, do you have any updates? So Singularity Net platform to address that first, because that, 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 that's really the core. I mean, the Singularity Net platform, we launched the beta of uh, toward the beginning of, of, of 2018. And now we're launching more and more cool, thing, cool things there. We launched the request for AI portal actually today, which, which is a portal that lets people propose an AI they would like to see on the platform and then say, well, I'll give you, you know, 100,000 AGI tokens if, if you create an AI that, that solves this particular problem. Then early next year, we're launching the AI publisher portal, which makes it really easy for anyone to put their AI, AI on, on the platform, right? So now that the beta has been there, it's scaling up pretty well. We're making tools to make it easier and easier to publish your AI and to request and pay for other other people's AIs to be to be published there. We've done the PayPal interface, as I mentioned, which lets you pay for services with fiat currency. But all this, in the end, you know, it's a platform, it's a marketplace, and we need providers to put AI into it, and we need customers to use the APIs in the marketplace to get AI services. Now, we on the Singular Unit AI team are putting our own AIs in the platform, and this is part of our own attempt to use the platform to, to work toward general intelligence. We're using the platform for our AGI R&D. But ultimately, for it to succeed, we need a lot of AI developers to put their AI into the platform. And we need a lot of users to use the AI in the platform. So we're, we're going to do a lot of things to get traction on, on the platform in 2020. We're looking at 2020 as the year that we take the platform for being a sort of technological feat because getting a decentralized AI platform to run on the Ethereum blockchain was not easy, but we need to transition it from being a technological feat to being a real commercial force with a lot of user traction, right? And we're going to do some hackathons early next year aimed at both AI developers and, and, and users to try to get students to put stuff on the platform. But Singularity Studio is a spin-off company which we've created and spun off from the Singularity Net Foundation, aimed specifically at working with, with large enterprises to get the large enterprises on board the Singularity Net platform. So Singularity Studio is building enterprise software products that will then be licensed to large corporations, but the products on the back end use the AI in the decentralized Singularity Net platform. So as, as one example, suppose that you make a product that a hospital or a pharma firm licenses to analyze their clinical trials. So when they do a clinical trial for a drug, you use this AI product to estimate which humans are good candidates for the clinical trial based on, on their DNA and clinical medicine. If an AI can filter out people who are unlikely to succeed in, in that clinical trial with that therapy being tested, that gene therapy or that drug, you can increase the odds of the clinical trial considerably, right? But normally, if you build a product to help a pharma company or hospital filter out people to go into clinical trials, if that product needed some AI, say some natural language processing, some, some machine learning, some genomic analysis, normally whoever developed that product would code the AI themselves or put in their product. With the Singularity Studio design, Singularity Studio makes a product that helps pharma companies and hospitals filter out those who come into clinical trials. But for the NLP, for the genomic analysis, for the classification algorithm, that Singularity Studio product makes API calls into the Singularity Net decentralized marketplace, right? So the, the AI comes from Singularity Net, but the product itself is built by Singularity Studio. Right. And the, the, the pharma company or the hospital doesn't have to know what a decentralized network is, right? They're just licensing a product from Singularity Studio. But on the back end, the Singularity Studio product is paying AGI token for use of the, of the AI services in, in Singularity Net, which could be written by anyone, right? They don't have to be written by people working for Singularity Studio. So we, actually, we, we have been progressing on that behind the scenes. I mean, we've been doing product development and uh, we've been working with a number of, of customers. I mean, this clinical trial example is a, is, a, is a real one. And there's 
there's a media company we're, we're working with you, you, using some singularity net AI for personalized recommendation of, 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 of media, but not, not, none of those none of those are announceable yet, un, un, unfortunately. But but in 2020, there's going to be a lot of announcements regarding Singularity Studio and its customers as well. So if I am a, an AI developer, I go to the platform, I see some someone else wants me to develop an AI or wants someone to develop an AI for them. They have some specification, maybe they have some data which they need to get classified, for example. I will most probably program in Python. I will be using TensorFlow. I will be creating this application or some other library. So how sure. do I put it on the blockchain or do I put it on my server and then connect it to the blockchain? What is the actual process of deploying my AI on SingularityNet? Yeah, we don't we don't do hosting right now. So I mean that that's something that that will that will come before too long. So yeah, right. Right now, you have to host your AI somewhere. I mean, it could be on AWS, for for example, or or it could it, it, it could be anywhere on the planet. Actually, I mean, right, right, so right now, you 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 host your own AI, and in essence, you take your AI code, you make sure it has a well-defined API for the inputs and outputs, you put it in a Docker container, and then there's a Singularity Net interface that you sort of wrap it in within that within that docker container where you, you tell it what which are the api calls that, that, that need to be made and and then when you put that online the singularity net code in the docker container when it runs it sends a message telling the rest of the singularity net hey here i am right and so, and, and then you're part of the of the network but there there's an interesting distinction there which is something we've been wrestling with recently so singularity net it's a pure open decentralized protocol. Like any any anybody can can use it. Anyone can put an AI online. When their AI broadcasts, "Hey, I'm here," then the peer to peer network of, of singularity net agents will find it. So that's truly decentralized. Now, the singularity net foundation marketplace, which is a particular registry of singularity net agents, and then and then a website listing them. This, this is centralized, and the AI publisher that we're launching early next year, this is basically a simple web interface stepping you the process of submitting your AI to be listed in Singularity Net's marketplace. And for that, we need to KYC the, the creator, and we need to test the thing to be sure that it works and doesn't just show child porn on your screen or something, because mm. basically there's... There's a legal liability for us of, of, of listing the listing the AI on, on, on our, our website. So there's you can almost view Singularity Net as a meta marketplace where you could have multiple different marketplace registries and, and use user interfaces. Because one example is I'm a US citizen. So if I make a website listing a bunch of AIs from Iran. Donald Trump may come and, and try to try to lock me in jail, right? Probably not personally, although that would, that would be good television. But I mean, we're, we're because of these sanctions, which I personally think are completely. But that's idiotic. just a front. Ju that's just a fronted, right? So it doesn't really matter if your front end is oh, down yeah, or correct. you have. Some guy in Iran can make their own Singularity Net marketplace website listing all the Iranian Singularity Net AI agents. And anyone who's not afflicted with the wrong citizenship, right? They can they can go there and they can, and they can they can they can find those, right? And so that that's a simple example of the beauty of a, a decentralized backend, right? I mean, you you can build various centralized marketplaces or centralized applications on, on top of it, but the the plumbing is a is a pure a pure decentralized network right so it's i mean it's almost it's almost as if you were building itunes on top of BitTorrent or something right so yeah, which mm -hmm. is, is is the is the right way to do it just like you want the infrastructure of the internet to be open source even though it's okay there's some proprietary software run, run, running on top of it and the payment is in uh, singularity net uh, token for all of these services how, how or yeah. can i get paid in something else as well so the Singularity Net protocol 
requires AGI token for payment, which is an ERC-20 utility token that was minted by Singularity Net Foundation. From a practical point of view, we made a PayPal interface. So you can actually pay for AI services on the platform using fiat currency. There's a percent fee paid to PayPal, like, like there always is. Mm. But what happens there on the back end is the PayPal interface you know, it, it turns the dollar into AGI token, and then AGI token is used in, in, in the plumbing of, of, of the platform. And I, again, I think that's fine. You can have whatever whatever front ends you want. I mean, different countries are going to have different laws, and, and different people will have different preferences. But I think that the basic payment mechanism in the guts of the network shouldn't shouldn't be tied to the to any any company or, or, or to any country it, that, that, that should be a sort of decentralized community based thing. And that, that, that's why we did it this way with the AGI payment token. All right. Yes. Please ask more questions in, uh, in the chat. I see some people talking about Joe Rogan uh, experience. So I actually put it in the description so you can guys, you can go and watch uh, Ben on Joe Rogan. Uh, there were some uh, comments about string theory. It's, it's a bit uh, off topic about singularity net, but what is your view on that? Uh, can, can you explain th string theory to our audience, what it even means? I think that, that, that would take a long time and be a large, large digression. I mean, I mean string theory, it's, it's a fascinating physics theory. I, I, I have leaned toward loop quantum gravity type theories in, in my own reading on unifying general relativity and, and uh, and the standard model of, of quantum theory. But uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I guess a more pertinent point there though, is I think once you have an AGI system, which has sensors at the subatomic level, once it can see inside the bubble chamber and, and the particle accelerator and the tokamak, that AGI system is probably gonna create its own models of physics at, at that scale. And it's probably going to come up with different fundamental theories of unified physics, which are not the same as string theory or, or, or loop quantum gravity or, or anything that we're imagining. Because right now, like we have some intuition for classical physics, but it's quite challenging to get an intuition for, for things at, at, at the, the quark and, and gluon and intervenient vector boson level, right? But, but an AGI, which has sensors at that level, could form its own intuition for, for subatomic physics. And then, then you're gonna get femto computers and ADO computers designed by that that AGI, which is where you're really getting into the into the post-singularity scenarios though. So I'm all right. I love thinking about this sort of thing. Right now I'm spending more time thinking about how to get AGI developers and uh, and and product developers using the singularity net platform so that we can move this society of minds toward general intelligence because now, now we're still trapped in the narrow ai phase right we got to get beyond the narrow ai phase to the agi phase maybe by this sort of integrated society of minds approach that we're doing in singularity net then once you have a human level agi that you know absorbs human values and hopefully becomes a compassionate human level agi that human level AGI can program a superhuman AGI, that can program a super superhuman AGI, and then ultimately you're getting you're getting to the uh, you know the quark and, and gluon level femto and ado computing based post singularity supermind. But I mean, even if even if that's only a couple decades from now, there's a lot of intermediate steps we're going to have to go through along the way. There are many questions in the chat that I can see right now about Sophia. Uh, so Fat Zero asks, when will Sophia's codes will uh, when will they be open sourced? Uh, well, that that is a question for my good friend, Dr. David Hansen, uh, not for me. So I mean, I I had a really good time in the three and a half four years I spent as chief scientist and head of software in in Hansen Robotics. I mean, leading software development for Sophia and other Hansen robots. And we, we did some really interesting prototyping using Singularity AI tools to control Sophia and more recently to control the Philip K. Dick robot that we 
also another Hanson Road, we showed off at the, the Web Summit. But I mean, for this year, but for the last couple of years, I've been focusing more on Singularity Net and the, the cloud based AI platform. But I, I mean, one of the goals with Singularity Net is to make a decentralized mind cloud for, you know, compassionate humanoid robots like like Sophia and, and many many other humanoid robots. So yeah, we I would uh, I look forward to getting getting back more into that in in, in, the, in the next couple of years. Also, Fat Zero continues and asks about uh, the future where we can train bots to work for us and eventually get rid of retirement. And I think Fat Zero touches on a very important economical topic: the fact that uh, so many countries in this world have unfunded the retirement, and uh, it might uh, become a problem in the near future. And technology is maybe one of the few solutions we have to that, that we can be more productive with technology with, for example, bots that can take care of us when we're old. So what is your view on that? It's very obvious to me that within the next few decades, essentially every human job will be up, will be obsoleted. I mean, in, in the sense that functions of producing physical objects or delivering practical services like cleaning the floor, serving a burger, dri dri driving a car, sweeping the street, doing doing your taxes, answering the phone. There's going to be AIs and unintelligent automated systems that do all these things at a lower cost and higher quality than, 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 than human beings. And this obviously will entail a wholesale reorganization of our social and, and economic system. And I think the the end state of that, I think, can be awesome. I mean, the end state of that can be a, a society where humans, you know, 3D print whatever physical objects they need. They have devices to serve them whatever they want, and they can spend their time doing what they feel like. I mean, socializing, re reading, intellectual, artistic, spiritual pursuits, uh, virtual reality, pornography, I mean, whatever turns you on, right? And I mean, that, that's going to be, it's going to be great. I, I, I think, however, the transitional path there looks like it's going to be quite messy because the world now is really not, it, it, it's not ready for the complete obsolescence of the need for human labor because our society is still organized in a way that, that allocates humans basic resources only if they carry out, you know, tasks that, that, that someone else thinks merit being paid, right? And I mean, that, that how the transition happens, none of us can, can tell right now. My feeling is in the developed world, we're going to have a somewhat smooth path toward a universal basic income for, for everyone. And you see, the presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, in, in the US, is pushing universal basic income as a concept now. So everyone vote for Andrew Yang if, 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 if you're American. Great, great, great guy and much more of a futurist visionary than, than anyone else being taken seriously in US politics right now. In Europe, you're already closer to that. You've had, you've had more experiments with various mechanisms verging on universal basic income. But what worries me is who's going to give universal basic income to the average average person, say in uh, you know Abidjan or, or Addis, Ababa, Addis Ababa or the you know the the, the, the capital of, uh, of in Lagos, Nigeria, right? I, I mean, I, I don't think the developed world that's that's building most of the AI is going to give universal basic income to the average guy in, in Lagos or, or Addis Ababa, right? So what happens when the global economy no longer needs the labor force in Africa? I mean, everyone can leave the city, go back to being subsistence farmers, but there's tens of millions of people in cities there who aren't subsistence farmers anymore, right? Then what do the brilliant young hackers in Lagos and Addis Ababa, what what do they feel like doing when they see like starvation and lack of medicine in their own country because they're shut out of the world economy, right? I mean, what what power grids do they want to hack into? Right? So I, I mean, you you can mm. see you can see the potential for some dystopic 
intervals on the route to a most likely utopic future due to the intersection of AI and automation obsoleting the need for human labor and the current mode of geopolitical organization, which has really terrifying and unjust inequities wired into it. And there's going to be no one silver bullet solution to that by, by any means. I think that decentralized AI, like we're doing with Singularity Net, can be part of a solution to that, right? Because at least if AI is going to dominate more and more of the world economy, having a decentralized infrastructure for the AI, that gives more of a fighting chance to the developing world in having a significant role in this economy, as well as to the less privileged classes in, 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 the, in the developed world. But you're going to need a lot of different pieces to the solution. And frankly, you're going to need a, a, an uplifting of human consciousness of some kind if we're going to avoid really horrible messes. You're going to need more people to come at life from a position of compassion and, and understanding and less from a position of tribalism and, and ego. And you're going to need this uplifting of human consciousness to coincide with the rolling out of technologies like Singularity Net that provide a more dem democratic organization for technology. And if you don't have both decentralized technology and uplifting of consciousness, we're going to have a lot of pretty horrifying ups and downs on, on the way to the, the beneficial singularity. And uh, none of us knows exactly how it's going to unfold. Inequality is a very big part of this. There is this book called 21 Lessons for 21st Century, in which the writer talks about the fact that in the last century, you also had a lot of technological advancements, but still those advancements weren't enough to get rid of the working class. You still needed people to work in the factories, to produce and to work for you. You could not be wealthy without people working for you. So therefore, you could have these movements that protected workers' rights, for example, socialism, even communism uh, tried to do that. But still, you, you had something to say if you were in the working class. But now with AI, you face irrelevancy, which is much more dangerous, where, pe where people don't need you if they are powerful, wealthy, and they have AI. So how do you think we can, we can work with that? I mean, obviously, you have the platform Singularity Net where you try to decentralize the development of that, but still, it seems that the power houses in AI right now, the big tech, but also the big tech in China, not only in the US and, and the West, it seems that it's so much centralization there. And it, it oh. uh, for me right now, it doesn't seem like we we are that uh, that efficient at decentralizing and making AI democratic right now, at least. The powerhouses of AI innovation are very decentralized and they're mostly universities. So it's mostly PhD students or master's students in universities all around the world or, or young professors who are coming up with the new AI innovations. But the deployment of AI is, is, is very centralized. But the fact that innovation is open and decentralized is not, not trivial and, and is, is quite important, right? So in, in chip design, for example, that's not true. In chip design, innovation is proprietary and centralized in a few large companies, right? And and that's sort of, that's because it needs this expensive hardware to do to do the work. So I think the openness and decentralization of AI innovation sort of gives us gives us a foot in the door anyway. And it's true right now the AI ecosystem is very centralized. On, on the other hand, I'm old enough to have, have seen shift from you know a few big companies like ibm and wang computing making main honeywell making mainframes to this whole pc laptop mobile revolution right so i mean we we need another another revolution on the level of the pc revolution or the mobile revolution we need another revolution on that level toward decentralized ai but i'm, I'm also old enough to remember when gcc was a new thing, and, and then Linus Torvalds and Linux were a new thing, right? Because when those were first coming out, everyone said open source can't work. You don't know how many people mm -hmm. told me, like, <laughs> people will only work on something if they get paid for it. That's how people operate. How are you going to build something as complex as an operating system without without paying people to do the work? And, you know, the, the bottom line is, 
those people were half right, but open source worked. And what you have is people are getting paid to work on open source, right? So it wasn't as simple as, as the naysayers or the advocates said, but in the end, open source has taken over the internet and, and, and mobile. And you can see with very large, large effect, right? Why is Iran still on the internet? Why do Iran's computers still work? It's, it's, all, it's all Linux and the internet is open. And when, when Google and Trump decide to screw with Huawei, I mean, they can take the open source Linux parts of Android and put their own their own front end on it, right? So, I mean, you, you've seen a number of unlikely revolutions in the evolution of technology, even during during my own lifetime, right? So, I, I think uh, we can't rule out a decentralized AI revolution, and there's a bunch of us pushing to make it happen. Very interesting. And Singularity Net is uh, one of the most known projects in the sp space. Also, I saw people asking about competitors. Do you know which other projects do kind of the same thing in, in blockchain? B what other what other ecosystem participants do you have right now in, in your space? I mean, there's a lot of projects uh, playing in the intersection of AI and blockchain. And I think really, for all of us, the competition is not the other AI and blockchain networks, each of which has pretty low adoption at, at this point, right? I mean, the, the competitors are are Google and IBM and and, and Amazon and, and, and Microsoft. I mean, so I, we're working closely with, with Ocean Protocol, which is a decentralized AI and big data platform. I mean, we're we're working with Shivam, which is a decentralized genetic storage and, and AI analysis platform. I mean. But there's other great projects out there. I mean, Fetch.ai has has been progressing recently in the and Matrix. But there's there, there there's loads. And actually, we've created an industry organization called DIA, Decentralized AI Alliance, which has I guess now like 50 or 60 members, which are projects doing things at the intersection of AI and blockchain. And in the end, I think all these decentralized networks can interoperate with with each other, right? So you should be able to. You know, use AGI token to pay for a service on Singularity Net. But if that needs access some data or processing on the ocean, the AGI token should be convertible to an ocean token to to, mm -hmm. to pay for that at some reasonable exchange rate. So I think I think we're going to see a decentralized network of decentralized networks with with multiple different AIs AIs connecting to each other. And the question is whether that whole ecosystem that decentralized network of decentralized networks is going to compete successfully with the big tech behemoths, right? That, 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 that's really the quadrillion dollar question. It's not the competition among different decentralized platforms. So I think there's going to be room for a bunch of decentralized platforms. Let's talk about Bitcoin as as a closing topic. Uh, what what is your view on uh, Bitcoin's mission? What kind of role do you think Bitcoin will play in the world? There is talk about digital gold and being a macro asset. There is talk about uh, micro transactions, everyday transactions, and it seems to be shifting all the time. What is your view on that right now? What, what will Bitcoin do in the world? Well, I mean, Bitcoin was an amazing landmark creation when it was in, in, invented, and it's a it's a it's a really cool thing. I think it's sort of yesterday's technology by now. It's it's not it's not the decentralized technology I'm most excited about from a, like a an algorithm or, or tech point of view. As an asset, I mean I I own some Bitcoin and Ether, and I, I've never sold any. Right. So I, I, I mean I mean I, I think the idea of a digital asset makes sense. And I, 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 I see no reason why Bitcoin, like gold or, or diamonds, can't continue to ap appreciate in value. And there can be other digital assets also. So, I mean, that, that and the argument that it's been relatively uncorrelated with, with other assets ma 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 makes sense. I mean, there's a good logic to having some Bitcoin in your portfolio as, 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 an, as an investor. As a foundational technology, like for microtransactions or something, I think there's going to be better technologies than that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been working closely with Tufi Saliba from the, the Toda network, and that, that technology is not 
not as fully developed as, as, as Bitcoin yet, but I think when, when we can release, you know, a fully developed, fully decentralized Toga network, that's going to be one example of something much more suitable for a vast scalable network of microtransactions than, than Bitcoin. The thing is, Bitcoin was created for a certain set of requirements. Like Bitcoin, it had to work if there's only five people on the network and three of them disappear, right? I mean, it, Bitcoin was built to be bootstrappable from nothing, which is so beautiful, right? It, 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 it's an amazing thing. On the other hand, having this replicated ledger is, is really a, a hobby horse, right? That's like trying to climb up a mountain with a backpack of rocks on your back that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. the, the, the further you climb up the mountain. So, I mean, the, the Toda architecture has decentralized secure messaging with a decentralized proof of correctness, but there's no replicated ledger. Like you don't need, you don't need to keep a ledger and have copies of it everywhere. Right. So, and I think Toda does that, but there's probably going to be other systems that do that also. So I, I think there's going to be a whole generation of secure decentralized platforms for sending objects around that don't need a ledger to be copied over and over. And uh, I mean that, 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 that's going to be much more efficient for microtransactions in a world where you have a lot of network members online all the time. So it's just a different set of requirements, right? Bitcoin had to bootstrap from nothing. Now the question is, how do you be secure, fast, and decentralized in a world where there's a lot of network participants online all the time? And that requires a different software design than being able to start from nothing with, with five people in the, in, in, in the network. So I'm... I'm very bullish on, you know, blockchain broadly speaking, and on you know, in, in decentralized encryption-based platforms as a core part of the technology infrastructure. Whether Bitcoin becomes a core part of tomorrow's technology infrastructure, I I I don't know if that if that if that's going to happen. But it can be a store of value, even if it doesn't. Right, like gold. Gold hasn't advanced in its molecular structure in a long time, but the price keeps going up. What is your view on the smart contract platforms? Currently, you said that you, you have an ERC20 token, so you're based on Ethereum. Are you committed to Ethereum long term or do you feel well, more like you're agnostic? We're not, we're not committed to Ethereum. I mean, I like Ethereum, but it's amazing. It's been fun to, fun to play with, right? I mean, that was the first... That was the first platform that really made like a secure decentralized network possible to code without years of tedious effort, right? So it's, it's, very, it's very, very cool. On, on, the, on the other hand, now it may be that Ethereum progress is slowed down by backward compatibility problems. So, I mean, it, it, of, of course it is. How badly is the question, right? It might be that, that new platforms that don't have backward compatibility issues can, can, get, can go Go, go faster toward, toward, toward the next generation. So we designed Singularity Net from the beginning to be as blockchain agnostic as, as we could. If we wanted to swap Ethereum out for something else, that's really a very small code change inside Singularity Net code base. We also may make it multi-chain in future. So some of the AGI tokens migrate to other platforms and, and some some stay on on, on Ethereum. I mean, that, that, that would, make, would make perfect sense as well. Smart contracts are a critical concept, but I think the way Ethereum manages them is probably not optimal. Like most, most smart contracts are really, really simple and they don't need a turn complete language or even the full primitive recursive language. So probably what you want is a bunch of domain specific languages that let you say just what the smart contract needs to be in a certain domain, like a domain specific language for networking smart contracts, a domain specific language for finance and insurance smart, smart contracts, a domain specific language for medical smart contracts. And then maybe you have a general smart contract programming framework that generates smart contracts in these domain specific languages by automatic program specialization. Because once you have a smart contract in a DSL just for a domain like finance or networking, it can run really fast and it's easy to prove correctness using like f formal formal program checking mechanisms. So there's a company called uh, Kirik based in Novosibirsk that has a system that 
that, that does this. I mean, it, it deals with DSLs for domain specific smart contracts and it can automatically generate these. So, I mean, I think, but that's just one example. There's going to be a lot of other platforms besides Kira doing similar things too. So I think the concept of smart contract is, is critical, but I'm not sure solidity is, is the final form that, 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 that it's going to take, right? I mean, if you look at you look at the evolution of programming languages, it it took a while to get to it took a while to get to languages as 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 slick as the ones that are the most popular ones now, and the same may be true in in the smart contract domain. And Ethereum also is changing so quickly. Next year is going to be Ethereum 2.0 with uh, a new programming language that is probably going to be launched uh, next year as well, uh, yeah. Viper. So we'll see We'll see how that gets uh, adopted. But uh, for now, I agree with you that a, a lot also has to do with formal verification, that Solidity is not really optimized for that. And uh, therefore, people are now excited about Cardano and other platforms that have functional programming. Uh, where Cardano, they... yeah, I mean, Cardano is really a beautiful design i mean i i i i like uh hoskins's thinking uh, i love the haskell programming language and you know i like many things about the cardano design i would say until i started digging into the proprietary parts of the toda code base i thought cardano was the best thing out there then i realized Toda got rid of the replicated ledger altogether, which is which 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 is even better. But I mean, Cardano, Cardano is is, is really a thing of beauty. Yeah, and I mean, Ethereum, Ethereum was groundbreaking, like Bitcoin was groundbreaking. But in its current form, Ethereum is not what you need to build like the decentralized infrastructure of of a super intelligence. You 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 really want something that can generate programs, smart contracts in sub languages that are no more general than they need to be so that formal verification is, is, is efficient. But of course you could do that within the Ethereum framework. You could do that within the Bitcoin framework too in principle. It's just a question of how hard is it to do in each of these frameworks and where does it actually happen first? Have you looked at uh, Tezos? Because that also has um, uh, functional programming with f f easier formal verification. I have never tried to do anything practical with, with, with Tezos. I, actually, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I knew a lot about Tezos in the early stages because I was friends with uh, Johan Gevers, who, who, who was on their board. Mm. But but I haven't, I haven't since they started rolling stuff out. I, I've never played with it. There, there's just too many. Some guys on our project, are I'm sure. Yeah, they're just like there's too many, there's too many AI papers out there. There's too many blockchains. And NEM, NEM is another cool blockchain that I've always liked. Like the the proof of importance consensus mechanism is is is, is quite interesting. And I've I've been looking at how do you work a proof of importance or proof of reputation ingredient into a, into a Toda type system because I think. Proof of stake is cool, but in the end, in, in, in a way, proof of stake devolves into you have to be rich to be a full participant, right? So proof of reputation or proof of importance in the social network, like NEM has, that's more fundamentally democratic, uh, I think. But you have to tune it just right, otherwise it becomes an unfair popularity contest. So in the end, I think what you're going to have is multiple sub networks of the global blockchain network with different consensus mechanisms. And maybe that's how it should be. Like you have a sub network that's proof of stake, but you have one that's, that's proof of reputation or, or proof of importance. You have some that are proof of work of different forms. And then you need interoperability between all of them. But whether that happens because these are all sub networks in TOTA or because like these are totally different blockchains, and we just have an efficient interoperability layer between them, right? I mean, there could be a lot, a lot of ways that happens. I know Cosmos tries to do that sort of interoperability, but it's not so efficient the way it happens. I think you want the interoperability at a lower level in the different blockchains somehow. But there's a there's just a few cycles of tech development to get to where we need to be. So we're, you know, we're developing a lot of things concurrently 
at, 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 at the same time. It's a very much a juggling process because we're we're building out the Singularity Net platform on a technical basis. We're trying to get adoption for the early form of it. We're working on OpenCog toward general intelligence deployed on Singularity Net platform while the platform's being built. Then with Dia Decentralized AI Alliance, we're trying to build toward interoperability among different decentralized AI projects. But then on the blockchain in, in infrastructure level, you know, there, there's all this improvement that needs to happen there. And that may have to do with interoperability among different blockchain projects also. But I mean, in the end, you know, the internet and PCs, all these things developed in a similar modality of uh, creative chaos with all the different parts of the technology ecosystem developing developing in, in parallel. I mean, that, that's, that's what makes it exciting. And that's the best part of crypto, according to me, that it's so early and it's still so many problems unsolved, meaning that there's still so many opportunities. Because when all problems are solved, then, yeah. We live in a time when multiple tech revolutions can happen within one human lifetime, right? That, which is unique in human history. And, 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 and they also affect each other. They are also, they are also interconnected, those uh, revolutions, like AI, blockchain, IoT, it's all placed together as well. Absolutely, yeah. There's quantum computing as well, which is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think within five to ten years, the servers on our server farms, they're going to have QPUs alongside the GPUs, and we're going to have various parts of Singularity Net and OpenCog function relying on, on various specialized quantum computing circuits, which we haven't even gotten into here. So, yeah, there's, there's so, so many parts to the... Uh, the technological singularity that that's emerging no one can keep up with with all the pieces of it no matter how hard we might try right ben it was a pleasure to have you on i learned a lot i think people also learned a lot i see a lot of good positive comments and guys thank you so much for being here as well and contributing to our uh, conversation with your questions i will give away academy today to uh alexandros uh, something 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 because he used a very strange font anyway yesterday he commented that he learned how to look at the bigger picture in reality the crypto and bitcoin trend is upward when talking about long-term investment and also learned that 2013 was the best bull year not 2017 in terms of percentage so alexandros please email me contact at ivontech.com we will be adding you to the academy and guys if you want to be in the giveaway on monday just comment what you have learned today ben thank you so so much we will be following the project also take a look at the joe rogan episode with ben as well that was very interesting and i hope to see you soon on joe rogan again people have commented that you need to you need to go back to joe rogan i'll definitely be back all right Th thanks a lot awesome, great, ben. Great Th thank you very much Bye-bye-bye. Yeah, it's good fun. Bye-bye-bye.